I want to thank I want to thank the guys at Design Museum Boston, and you guys seriously uh, have have made us feel very very welcome in this city. Um, to to all I mean seriously to the city itself, the BRA, everybody who's who's really welcomed us into Boston and helped us make this a home for us. Um, I kind of live on JetBlue. I spend some time in Portland. I spend some time here. Um, but uh, it's, you know, we, we feel very welcome here in, Port in, in Boston. Um, so, like Sam was talking about, uh, I, I kind of I have two hats. So, one side, I do development with Gerding Eadland, which is, like he said, a sustainably minded development company. We've done, I think, 50 plus LEED certified buildings, uh, many of which were the first of their kind. First gold condo, the first platinum performing arts space. Um, so we've always, our, our mantra is always, what else can we do? What else can we add? How, how far can we push sustainability? Uh, and then the other side is, is actually, um, I, it's my work in progress. It's my little startup. Um, there's this, I'm not going to talk too much about the, the network, but there's an international network of, of shared office spaces called Hub. How many have heard of Hub? So myself and, th and three uh, or two others, rather, are starting uh, Hub Portland. And, and what Hub is, is is a shared membership community for social entrepreneurs. Um, and I want to start there, because it's, it has a lot to do with what we're going to talk about later on. The reason why we decided to start this was because we looked around the Portland community, the community of entrepreneurs working in, in Portland, and, and there's this disconnect. It's an incredibly strong community in pockets, but yet there's this, like, this void, this kind of this clash between the techies and the makers and the programmers and all these different things, and there's this, this void. There's no kind of single space where people can come and coalesce. And so our idea is that, is that place has a, has, a, has a unique ability to bring together community. And that's kind of what I want to talk to you about today. This title, I came up with it pretty quickly, and I. I didn't like it, and now I kind of do like it because there's a lot of there's a lot of this is really important, especially here in this neighborhood now. How many people have have seen the signs that say Innovation District? They know what's going on. It's such this. It's a really cool idea. It's a really really cool idea. And I'm, I mean, I work in San Francisco and Portland and Chicago and New York and D.C. and I've never seen a city more supportive of of the work of entrepreneurs, or at least, at least trying to do something. And I think this is this, this golden opportunity where, where, we can, where we can look at entrepreneurship in, in, and, and really, really drive it forward in a way that it, it could never possibly be in, in other places. It's such an interesting word, and I, and I really want to dive into that. The word entrepreneur and what it, what it is, you hear, how many, how many people call themselves entrepreneurs? How many people say, I'm an entrepreneur? Fantastic. There are so many people who use that word for so many different things. And, and, and when you sit there and go, oh, yeah, totally, yeah, I, I, I know what I do. I, I work my butt off trying to make things happen. We're hearing it in political speeches. We're hearing it all over the place. The, the two candidates running for mayor in Portland have a whole section on their website on entrepreneurship. I don't know if, I mean, I think people have a vague recollection or a vague idea of what it is, but I think in many ways it's become muddled because it's such this focus right now in terms of how are we going to move our economy, how are we going to change, and, and, and this changing workforce and this changing thing, it's been ascribed to generations and all these different things. I think that that word is losing some of its meaning and losing some of its value. And I know this is super dorky, but I went like, I went old school and went towards the, the definitions, but there's, there's a point to it. That, the point to these, I want you to notice a through line. Thank you, Wikipedia. A person who organizes and operates a business taking financial risk to do so. I want you to notice one, two things. Risk, which is obviously an inherent portion of entrepreneurship, and a person. 
Similarly, Merriam-Webster, one who organizes, manages, and assumes the risk of business or enterprise. One, risk. Now, this next one is actually my favorite. It reminds me a little, it's very Shakespearean. The entrepreneur is our visionary, the creator in each of us. We are born with the quality and it defines our lives. Yada, 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 it's up, that, that we respond to what we see in here in experience, it's developed and nurtured, and it's given, if it's given space to flourish, it can, it can be successful. If not, it dies. I, it's, a, it's a beautiful image, and I don't discount any of these definitions, but I feel like we're missing something. Something is being missed out of these. If you were to take a look, and, and don't read too much into like who I picked, they're just common faces that people know. Patagonia, Chouinard. Zuckerberg, Steve, Tony Hawk, Branson. All of these guys are great visionary people. They've had great ideas, they've taken the risks, but at the end of the day, there's always been something tangible. If you look at the definition, yes, one can take risk and one can have great ideas and one can do all these things, but unless there's something tangible, it's, it's kind of hard to say, I've done something. These guys have all done interesting things. So how, how do you look at that and say, ideas must come to life. In order for entrepreneurship to really work, ideas need to come to life. Something needs to happen. Something tangible needs to happen. So in that premise, how does this gentleman, who probably wrote over there, how does he become an entrepreneur? Let's break it down somewhat mathematically. Idea plus risk plus hard work equals product or business. I know that's very simple and I know that's kind of a soft way to describe it. But if you were to look at it that way, the idea plus the risk plus hard work creates something. Okay? Creating an idea, the plight of the entrepreneur, is hard. It sucks. You have to risk everything. You have to hustle. You have to forego relationships. You have to do, it is all, it's, that's what you do. You live, you breathe, you die, all these things. Guess what? You're not alone. And as you look at those definitions and you see one and you see a person and you see all these things, guess what? It's not just you. It's not just about you. And I don't mean that, don't take offense to that. That's just the tip of the iceberg to highlight it that way. Because guess what? It takes a whole lot of other people to make those ideas come to fruition. It takes VCs, it takes people to finance, it takes idea generators, programmers, co-founders. It takes supporters, it takes your mom, it takes ideas of the past, it takes people who came before you, it takes aspirational entrepreneurs, it takes a ton of different people to make these ideas come to life. So if you were to say, what is an entrepreneur? An entrepreneur is a person who takes risks, who does all these things, it is a person, but guess what? The product of entrepreneurship if it is the, the coming to fruition of these ideas, an entrepreneur is only a piece of the equation. They may spark the idea, they may be a catalyst for that idea, but it takes a community of entrepreneurs to get to that end result. It takes community. It takes an entire group of people to bring this to life. Now, there are instances where one person does it, and that just, wow, good, good job. But for the most part, it requires a community of support to make things happen. You look at a place like this. In fact, this is pretty incredible. This is a place where you have that support. It's a community organization that, that helps ideas come to the surface. It helps them come to fruition. In other words, you're not alone, and that's a good thing. It's about community. This is where we start today. It starts with community, and I really want to dive into a piece of community that not a lot of people, I think not a lot of people look at. In fact, it's typically the background of it. I'm going to show you four images, and I want somebody to think about it as we go through these four images. Take a look and notice the through line. Kind of similar to where we are today. These four images have a through line. Can anyone tell me what it is? It's not apparent. That's fine. It's what's in the background. It's what's behind these people that is the most interesting to me of these images. You take a picture of people, obviously people look at the people, that's what they're looking at, but what be is behind the image is a place. It's a place that brought these people together. There is, there is no coincidence why 
This can exist on this street. That's in Portland, by the way. Again, it's all real, the Portlandia stuff. This is another, another place in Portland. This can exist because of the construct of the place, the space, rather. But in this instance, space is given a higher purpose because of the community that finds value in it. It becomes place. That's what I want to talk about today. The idea of place. The idea that place, capital P, is the convergence of community and, env and environment. It is the physical world given meaning by the individual or group of individuals that bring people together. So if you think about community and you think about the premise that I set up in terms of entrepreneurship, if entrepreneurship is ideas coming to life, life needs community, community needs place, place and ideas are almost, like, almost on an equal level. You need to have place for these ideas to form. You need to have place for this to, 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 to really bear fruit and, and come to life. Do you remember when you were a kid in like eighth grade and they always talked about ecosystems and they talked about birds and the bees and the, and the earth and all this stuff and this was like utopia. The synthesis of the physical place and community is that ecosystem. This up here is an ecosystem. And when the two come together in a way that's, that's, that, that just works, that's when ideas come to life. I want to talk to you about 10 principles. And this is when we go and we, so we build buildings. And, and when I look at Hub and I look at the stuff, in fact, we're doing two projects down the street from here, uh, one of them which will open in, in, in February called Factory 63. It'll be the first site of innovation housing. It's like, to me, it's the coolest project because it's this perfect synthesis of, of the way people are working and living today with this open shared, uh, shared workspace, conference rooms, all this stuff. The main entrance, though, is on the inside. And the two exterior doors are just open. It's for the community. We'll talk about that in a little bit later. But these 10 principles, this goes into exactly what we've done down there and exactly what we've done in other projects. This is the way we do it. This is the way we work to build the infrastructure for place to become place, for space to transform into place. These 10 things we're going to go through. First is build community. Actually, I, don't dis I disagree with this one. And, and I know, so it's a family company. I know my father's like, he'll kill me for this. I disagree with the way this is written. It's, it should be build for community. When you build, it should have in mind the people who will work within and around it. That should be the only thing you think about. Don't get overzealous. This isn't a trophy thing. This is about the people. There's, no, there's, just, there's just no way to go about it. I want to give you an example. This is district in Portland, which a gentleman who is here, he's, he, he lived in Portland. He'll know this. It's in Cooch Street, very close by. This is called the Brewery Blocks. This is a project that we did back in, in 2000. This area was a wasteland. This was a place that nobody and their mom ever wanted to go to. I grew up there. I didn't want to go there. It was, it was just, it was bad. Um, it had pockets of light, but it was just this, it was, if you wanted to score something, I guess that's where you'd go. Um, this is an old brewery. And when this shut down, these five blocks were open. So we bought them and decided we were going to do some significant historic renovation um, as well as new development work. What's interesting about this is, is the combination of uses. So you have housing, housing, a performing arts space, uh, art institute, office, creative office with restaurants and whatnot, Whole Foods. That was the first Whole Foods in Portland. So you have all of these different things going on. And underneath this is the part I want to talk about. It's the parking garage, which I know is a weird thing to talk about, but the parking garage is probably the most unique thing I've, I, I think we've ever done. Because the parking garage is actually two and a half city blocks underneath this whole thing. And actually, every single, except for this building, all of these buildings are serviced by one parking garage, which means everybody coming to every one of these things has to go through that parking garage. It means everybody has to see everybody. And while there are some private elevators, these two corridors are the main access points to where, to where you come out. I know this is, it's a corridor. It's, it's a hallway, an outdoor hallway. Most people would say there's nothing important. That's the coolest part of this entire project. 
Because when you come up, it's not a super wide hallway. In fact, in fact, if we were standing there and you were walking down, we'd be about this far away, which is not too far away. We'd be like, oh, you're way over there. I'll, I'm, see ya. But not like too close where we're bumping into each other. It's, it's kind of like this perfect distance where I, can, where I can have a nice conversation with you or I can come up and say hi. So you get these conversations that start to happen, multiple conversations, and then pretty soon you get this pile up of people. And then that starts to spill out. Now, keep in mind, there's benches, there's coffee shops spilling into the street. So you've got all of these things, this, this like coalition of all these people in this one spot. And then this, these sidewalks are like double wide. So then people are spilling onto the sidewalks and then spilling into the streets and cars are stopped and all this stuff. That, to me, it's, it's this small touch, it's this small physical space that forces people to turn in and have a conversation. Build for community. That same community, create inviting spaces. Let's look at a couple images. That's that, that's that corridor. That's a street just up the way. That's every first Thursday, the streets are flooded with people. Those are independent artists throwing their stuff out in there. That street's shut down. It's a normal street. People driving it, gone. That has become a place because of its invitation. This is that theater. This is, during the day, this is a community hotspot. You can go and listen to lectures, you can hear readings, you can do whatever you want in the space. It's always open, it's always available to people. It's inviting, it's a place you wanna be. Pi, Portland Incubator Experiment. This is our big, one of our big incubators. Uh, again, it's flooding in the streets. This is Wyden and Kennedy's world headquarters. Zombies love it. Create inviting spaces. Minimize your carbon footprint. Now, I know people say go green. This is our shtick. We always, this is what we do. But I think go green, again, like entrepreneurs, it's, it's kind of gotten watered down. Um, when I say minimize your carbon footprint, create a building that's not going to last for 50 years or 75 years, that's going to last for 200 years or 300 years. I think Boston's probably one of the greatest places to look at that. You look at and these buildings that have been here forever and ever and ever. Build for the long term. We have a project in, I was, down in uh, a district in Portland where we put in a biomembrane reactor, which what it does is it takes, it takes, uses microorganisms to clean out the gray water, pumps it back in. That building is a closed loop system. We can be completely off the sewer grid, completely off the sewer grid. That building will last for hundreds of years. Minimize your carbon footprint. Connect buildings to people and nature. So if you're going to create a building that's sustainable, you need to help the community understand and be part of that conversation as well. Connect them to nature, connect it in the building, connect it around the building. Encourage transit alternatives. I don't need to explain this one too much, but you build in cities for a reason. Be close to public transit. Transit scores are, are, are godsend. Craft the first 30 feet. Now this is an interesting thing. If my introduction is here to a building, the facade of the building, the building doesn't stand alone. The first 30 feet of it is what brings you to the front door. Craft the first 30 feet. If you want to create inviting spaces, start from the street level. Inspire communities with art and design. It's both a point of conversation and it's a point of reference. It's a place to, where you can stop and have a conversation. Likewise with design, design should facilitate lifestyle. Make that part and parcel with space. This is a project we did in, in Portland. Um, where you've got this great ceramic piece. And this is like, I think this is one of the most successful lobbies we ever did because you've got kind of a similar s setting where everybody comes up from the same garage and it's like this bottleneck. Everybody stops there to talk and it's, it just becomes the place to be. Make 20 minute living real. So 20 minute living is a concept that we have where in, within a 20 minute sphere, you should be able to live, work, learn and play. Now, likewise, 20 minute living is not just the people around you, it's yourself. You need to be part, to be part of a community, you need, to, you need to be part of that 20 minute life cycle. So the idea is, is that if I work, I can get to where I need to within a 20 minute period, vis-a-vis -vis public transit, vis-a-vis -vis walking. I can get to coffee, I can get to, I can get to restaurants. Place making requires selection, requires where you need to go in a certain spot so that this can be part of it. Integrate schools and neighborhoods. It's kind of like this, having conversations. The, idea, the, the ability to pontificate and have conversations should be part of the, of the culture of the place. Integrate your neighborhoods. You can't do it without them. Protect symbols that matter. History matters. Recognize that you are not the first one in this place, that you are the second or third or fourth or fifth, that this place has been here for a while. Recognize that there are people who are here who have been here for a long time and they're part of the conversation as well.
protect symbols that matter. So here we are. We're here in Boston in the Innovation District. And we have a unique opportunity, have a unique opportunity to create place. We are, the projects that we're doing down there, we're just part of the conversation. And, 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 and we want to be a larger part of that conversation. Without, without that place, without that, 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 that the vibrancy and the connection that what, what brings people together, ideas don't come to fruition. It just lies flat. Place is important. Thank you very much. Any questions? Just make sure you repeat the question. Perfect. Yeah, we'll do. I think, well, I mean, for, for the types of spaces that are in Factory 63, which in all actuality, I, I, we've, I've heard micro, this and that and the other thing, they actually aren't ridiculously small at all. I mean, if they're in the 500 to 550 square foot range, which doesn't matter, I mean, I don't know what you're living in, but that's not, I mean, like, I'm, we're pretty used to that. And like you said, I mean, it's, it's kind of a different, I don't think people will move from one to the other simply because of the conceptualized nature of Factory 63. The coolest part about Fa Factory 63, and it's like the reason why it's my, fa it's the smallest project we're doing, but it's like my favorite one, which is, I spend far too much time on like the littlest project, but it's um, because 90% of the units are innovation units. So the whole pitch, the whole, the whole idea, I mean, it basically you create almost like an incubation environment. So, so it's, it's more of a, a conceptual lifestyle than anything else. And so the difference between, it's going to be a pretty stark difference between the two, um, just, just by virtue of, of space and the way it's programmed. Um, I guess I didn't really go into this too much, but like the ground floor space here, this will all be shared office. So this will be the main access to the residents. But everything else is going to be all open. And then you've got this, which is the design innovation gallery. We're going to have, we're going to have curated events and whatnot within the space. So this, it's, just, it's just a whole different lifestyle between the two. So maybe if somebody wants to change a pace, but I guess that's my, that's my two cents. Yeah. Uh, how do you think, uh, I like your ideas about the 20-minute life cycle. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. So you have a tight community. It's more like a European city with uh, older infrastructure. So how do you think uh, you can implement, or what do you see, like, let's say, for the rest of America? Of course. How do you actually create that? Of course. Say, you know, the cars already in there, the fast food malls, you have you. It's more of a disconnect. There's not uh, as uh, much uh, a strong sense of community in places like that. Mm -hmm. Totally. So his question's about, about how do you expand that model to places where there's sprawl, I mean, where it's not, it's not as tightly compact. I mean, one of the reasons, I'll tell you first to answer the question, we target cities like this because it, it, make, I mean, it makes sense. It's walkable, it's livable. I mean, it, just, it, it fits our MO and it fits the, the type of work that we do, certainly from a sustainability standpoint. And Boston is, I mean, I can walk across the city in four minutes. It's like the coolest thing to me. Um, but that's, that's something that, that there's a lot of conversations about. Uh, it's a lot of conversations that I've been having a, with a ton of people across the country, because you're right. I mean, if, you, if you're going to make the claim that you should build for 10, 20, you know, multiple generations, you can't abandon what's already there. And we have suburban neighborhoods, and we have that. I think what we're going to start to see is, is 
hopefully, money is always a factor in this, uh, but you're going to start to see microcosms develop. I mean, you look at, a, I look in, in Portland and there's a, there's a number of, of what would be traditional suburbs that have, that have now, like there's this one, actually there's this really cool guy named Wes Hickey. Uh, he's in Portland, he's, a, he's just a kind of local guy. He grew up in this small town called Washougal. And Washougal was like, it's, it's part of this massive cluster of suburbs uh, in Vancouver, outside of Vancouver, Washington. You kind of walk in, you're like, what is this town? It's, it's, it's got this great, I mean, this, this small town was always, it always had its own infrastructure. It was almost like this. It always self, was self-serving, but it, had, it just had dissipated. That notion had dissipated. And so what he did was he created an epicenter, a, a, a central hub, as it were, that, that, that the community could use and the community could come, could come together in. It's a work in progress, but I'll tell you, the, the focal point went from outward to inward. And these microcosms, I think, are going to be a huge part of the way we, I don't want to say save the suburb, but change the notion of the suburb. Yeah? When coming into Boston for this particular project, you must have had a lot of interface with the uh, Architectural Association, the Historical Society, of course. and the Planning Commission you know, for, this, for this area here. Could you expand a little bit on what else is in store that you, know, you might have come across? Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting. I mean, we're, I, I recognize that we're, we're part of the conversation. So his question was, what's, what else is happening? And, and obviously, we've spent a lot of time with, with the BRA and working with these guys. And, and I'll tell you, you know, we've been very, 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 very fortunate to, to have s such great support from them. And I couldn't thank them. You know, I couldn't thank them more. Um, you know, part of, that, part of that is it's kind of twofold. It comes from the top and it comes from within. You know, we've, we've spent the last couple years really, really getting to know everybody who's involved and trying to make those, trying to, to kind of create a partnership as it were, to create some sort of a, a connection so that we all, so that we're all kind of doing this together. Um, the other side of that is, is things like this, talking to, talking to, to, talking to groups like this where we can say, hey, you know, we, we're just one piece of the conversation. I need you. I do. I need you to. I need you to provide feedback, and I need to. I. I just. We need to continue these conversations elsewhere. Um, there's a lot of. There's a kind of a lot of planned stuff in here. What'll happen? I mean, it, it's. It's kind of. I think the economy is a, a telltale sign of what'll. What'll go and what won't. Um, I know there's a lot of work going on, but. Uh, you see all over the place. I know, and 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 you probably will for for a little while. Great. Which you know will only continue to develop, and, and the, the the innovation housing program I, I hope is successful. I think we've got a really really cool opportunity because it's so much of the building. So we'll see. I mean I think there's a there's a lot changing and there's a lot happening. So we will we will see. Time will tell. Yeah. I uh, just want to thank you for a good uh, an inspiring lecture. On the Thanks. The Society. I work uh, as an intern here with a construction company called Skanska. Oh yeah. I know that you have some partnership going on over in Oregon and Portland. Yeah. Uh, and I had a question about the last out of the ten, the symbols that matter. Yeah. What symbols that matter have you seen in this area and how, how will you protect them from the No, that's a that's a really good point. Um, I think in fact taking it back to Factory sixty three, that building was built hundreds a hundred and ten years ago or something like that. Um, that, that is a that that building. There's no way in heck I'd want it. I'd want that to go anywhere. Um, and and again, taking that. How do you make it last for another hundred years and another hundred years after that? Um, so we we're doing some significant. I mean, it's a significant significant job to that to keep it for a very long time, converting it into a lead platinum uh, residential. I mean, that's a that's a significant piece. Um, I think when it comes to symbols, it's, it's both macro and, and micro. I think that there's, there's uh, a certain level of, of respect you need to pay attention to in terms of the history of it. Um, there's this really cool thing in, in any historic building, you always have this little, this is always this, this like plaque thing that you, and then on every building, if you ever look at it, there's always this little, this plaque. And that, you'll see if you, if you go on the website, you'll see it's, it's everywhere. It's always reminding that there is the, there is something that's something that's been there for a long time, and really looking into the history of that and 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 making that part of the conversation has been a huge piece of what we do. Um, I mean, outside of that, there's there's always this blend of the new and the old, and I think that you, there's this there's this there's this respect that you need to have to the past as well as where that's going in the future. 
Um, and so with like 319A, you brought that up. Um, that is, that's a brand new building. That's a brand new building. How do you then weave that within the historical context? Design, significant design. How does that work? How does it work within the cluster down there of that alleyway? Um, those are all those are all pieces with, which will be part of the, that are part of the conversation. One second, and we'll follow up here. Yeah, of course. Uh, talking about development, it's all it's really hard to get the financial model in place. Of course. And when you do sustainable development, how do you finance such a project? I mean, it's just a lot of money to buy the latest technology. It is. It's a lot of risk. As an entrepreneurial company, you're pushing all the risk and, and the money into such a system. Totally. How do you how do you uh, how do you how do you go along with that? With that? Yeah. So, so his questions on, on sustainability. Yes, it costs, it costs a lot more. Um, it costs a lot more. We've done it for, I think we, we, I guess we started really diving into it. Like I always joke that green was just a color when we started. So we've done it for so long that, that we've gotten really good at, okay, if you're gonna change this, and let's say you add a, a solar PV. Um, that's gonna require less infrastructure in the building itself because you're, you're just, you just would be doubling up at that point, less coil, less, less wiring, less this, less that. So you end up with, you, let's say it's a 50%, a 50 cent premium, now it's a 10 cent premium. So there's ways to kind of offset that. The other side is, the other side is, you know, you look at it from a, from an energy, an energy modeling and energy saving. So one of the things we've really invested in is, is utility monitoring, um, energy modeling uh, in general, so that, so that the, so that we can always optimize our building's performance. Um, which has residual cost benefits. I mean, we always, every time we, we do something, like this project we did in, in Portland, we put the first inner city wind turbines. The first time anybody really ever put wind turbines on top of a building, hot, tall, big mass wind turbines. And, and you've got to look at the, you got to look at the, the long-term payout and you got to look at the, you just have to, you just have to look at it on a longer term basis. It's not, sustainability isn't, you don't see the residual benefits right away. You have to look at it long-term. Yes, sir. Just to touch on your point about the, the history of Boston, kind of weaving it into current architecture or construction. I'm friends with now with um, the executive director of Paul Revere House. And Paul Revere House, I don't know if anyone's been in the Phoenix Hill part of it, it's really small. They have a little courtyard and two houses. Well, they purchased the building that abuts the back of the equipment for a few million dollars. It came available, they raised the money and did it. And they're going to begin, the reason I don't know who's in the room, but they're beginning now the design and the actual construction to make that building a design center, a meeting space. I mean, I'm talking to them about an innovation center because Paul Revere from Old School Store, he was a real manufacturer and innovator. So if anyone's here and you're looking to get some exposure, this might be an interesting compliment, I guess, of so, no But it's weaving the old history. You don't want to be like New York, so I mentioned Manhattan. Boston should not try to be like, compare yourself to New York because there's so much uniqueness to Boston that you want to bring out. I live in Manhattan. You don't want to be like Manhattan. You want Boston. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. And I would just say that, um, Ernie Gamblin, you have been way too modest. Like, they are a fantastic company. The two buildings they're building are in Fort Point with the Landmarks District. Um, and they've worked tirelessly with the Landmarks community, the arts community, which has been there since or preserving that culture, working with the design museum. So they've gone above and beyond the developers, Archon, the previous owner of the buildings, and they've gone above and beyond what they've done, and even with like the signage that they're doing for the outside of the building, and repointing everything, and keeping all the old fire escapes. I mean, you guys have done a fantastic job sort of connecting the new with the old, and really preserving those that warehouse district. Hey, Boston's not talking. They're not going to let these buildings come down. No, no. <laughs> no more, no more tearing down the old. No, and, and and thank you very much for saying. I mean, we've every time, especially. I mean, when we when we came to Boston, we saw a lot of similarities to Portland. We we really wanted to create an East Coast base, um, and we we saw the city as. I mean, it just it just made sense. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful place to be, um, and and very humbly, uh, we've been very very blessed to have. The relationships and, and, and I guess the experience that we've had. It's been pretty incredible. Yes, question, follow up question. Uh, um, what kind of people from your organization do you send into such conversations? What was that? What kind of people from your organization do you send into such conversations, like with the, uh, with the arts communities? Of course. Oh, totally. 
Well, that's that, in fact, these guys can answer answer a little bit of that. We've um, so so when I said it was a family company, uh, I think the first connection you had was it with my mother? Yeah, yeah it was with my mother. Um, but <laughs> we're a really we're a really small organization. There's like I mean we do a lot across the country, but we're like twenty some odd people. Um, we keep it really small. We keep it really tight. We we've got a great working relationship. So people like myself, I do all of our I do all of our East Coast. So I all of our East Coast markets, I kind of follow and track and 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 work in uh, finding deals like this and and putting them together. And at the end of the day, my job may begin with a a, a piece of property that I, I think has a lot of potential for the stuff that we we want to do in our in our in our mission but my job doesn't end there it it ends it doesn't really end actually it just keeps going it, i mean it, it gives opportunities like this to to come and talk and that's that's the kind of people um yeah my mom my mom and Ann, and a woman named ann hudner they've spent tireless hours with these guys really working in the community um, and, and getting to know getting to know people. I, I mean, I've had the privilege of spending time with guys at Boston World Partnerships and, and all these. Eight. It's just fun to sit down and have the conversations. It's just so much fun. Yes, sir. How do you integrate uh, the shared social office spaces? I mean, you're here. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally, totally. So, so I mean, one of the things, and, and this is something we've seen. I, I mean, I've seen certainly it's been a downfall in Portland. I mean, it, it's just generally, if you if you look around, I mean, this is actually a perfect example of it. It takes curation, it takes it takes curation and long like long term curation. And so we've been working with these guys on on the, um, the that let's see if it's still up here, like this this wall. Well, this is obviously like everything moves out of the way and you get this open space. So we'll have events in there over the next, I don't know. I mean, we open in November, so we're going to have events in there from November till I don't know when. I mean, we'll just keep, it's going to keep going. But it, at the end of the day, it's, it's a community-driven space. I, I mean, I would hope you'd show up and, and do something and, and have a talk. Or I mean, this is, I mean, it's, 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 for, it's for that. It's, it's supposed to be open. It's supposed to have... I, I don't know, it's supposed to be for the community, both within and, and around. I mean, the idea is, is that you've got this, this really cool concept, this innovation housing deal, which I know there are people who say a bajillion different things. I think it's a really cool, I think it's got a lot of legs. I think it's got a lot of, of ability, especially in this context where so much, it's so tightly packed that people can really, really start to connect and really start to, um, to, to, to as, as we talked about, really start to bring these ideas to fruition with the community within as well as on the on the outside so i, I mean i think it's it, it begins with i think it begins with curation it's going to be it's going to it's going to take time to continue to develop but i encourage everyone here when we open to spend time down there it's a space for you so enjoy anything else yeah so you talked about the Yeah, yeah. So, what would you give us as a community on entrepreneurs as like the prime directives to achieve this uh, total coalescence uh, ecosystem? Uh, of course. Um, I think it's interesting because there are, you, you always see this this divide between I think place people who build things and and people who inhabit it, and I think that that's not. I think that that's not how it should be. I don't think I don't think that's how it should go. Um, I think I think supporting the the leaders like like Sam and like Derek. Everybody's doing everybody at Design Museum. I see at Mass Challenge. Keep the connections going. Keep keep bring keep. It's going to be about connecting groups. It's going to be about having those conversations with one another to in order for this thing to connect. I mean, in order for the web to kind of gel it's going to be about it's going to be about making some noise on 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 space it's going to be about it's it's going to be about connecting together that's going to be a that's going to be one of the biggest that's going to be one of the biggest things that that we're going to need in order to make this district a success it's, it's not siloing ourselves it's not saying i'm here and i'm there and i'm here and i'm there it's about saying i'm here but i'm I, i'm going to share we're going to share together we're going to work together sorry if that's a little esoteric and okay thanks guys
Appreciate it. Thank you.